All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at much less cost. If you are interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event. Dr. Tallis is a research scientist at the Center for Naval Analysis, a federally funded research and development center where he specializes in maritime security, naval strategy, and foreign policy. His project management experience includes directing cross-disciplinary teams, building novel research designs to address unstructured strategic and operational questions. He also conducted independent field research, including embarking USS Harry S. Truman during the U.S. Navy's first Arctic carrier deployment in nearly 30 years as civilian analyst and advisor to the strike group commander. Talis holds a Ph.D. in international relations from the University of St. Andrews, where he researched theories of literal security that resulted in the book, The War for Muddy Waters, Pirates, Terrorists, Traffickers, and Maritime Insecurity. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Make sure this works. Yeah. Um, thanks, Hannah. Thanks uh, to the Institute of World Politics for having me. I'll do the obligatory. There are empty seats. This is not a huge crowd, so you are welcome to sit in the back, uh, but you are also welcome to, uh, to join the crowd up front. I'm thinking I'm probably loud enough that I don't need to stand directly in front of the lectern the whole time. I'd also uh, welcome if this was more of a discussion, considering that this is a small group setting, so um, please feel free to interject with questions or throw things at me if, if I'm uh, not quite catching your eye. Um, otherwise, there'll be plenty of time for question and answer at the end. I'm hoping maybe take about 20 minutes just to talk about the subject here, um, but I'm happy to go longer. Um, and sort of do the question and answer as we go. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm at the Center for Naval Analyses. This work comes out of uh, my uh, some prior research and then some ongoing work that I'm doing on maritime security issues. Uh, for those who aren't aware of the Center for Naval Analyses, it's an FFRDC, a federally funded research and development center. Uh, so essentially, the Navy and the Marine Corps think tank. Um, I assume there are a few folks who are uh, students in the room who are maybe career transitioning or maybe haven't yet started careers. So if there are questions also about what it means to work in an FFRDC, I'm happy to tackle that, either in this context or one-on-one uh, -on -one afterwards. Okay, so I've got a bit of a threefold agenda, and this is, this is loose, um, but the, the general movement that I'm, I'm going to take us through today is to talk about maritime security broadly speaking, and the way I've been framing that is talking about maritime security in the way that it would resonate with a U.S. policymaker. Um, I'll get into a little bit, I think, why that maybe is both a, a hard sell but an important one in an era that we're in now, which over the last month or two, over the last several months has really been defined by this return to great power competition and the discourse that comes with that. I'll then turn to the, the main conceit of the book itself, which is maritime security, and what we can learn by an intersect of maritime security and criminology. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the implications for both practitioners on the one hand, and because this is uh, a graduate institution, also talk a little bit about the implications for academia, um, both of which are important, but obviously depending on the community you're coming from, uh, you'll gravitate towards one set of implications over another. A little bit first on how I got into the subject because I think it's instructive on the topic of maritime security overall. Uh, as any good grad student does when they're starting a project, you start with a literature review. And so what do you find if you do a basic literature review of maritime security issues? And the answer is that there's a lot of folks talking about specific issues, piracy, narcotics trafficking, human trafficking. Uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, IUU fishing, which is an incredibly important subject that, despite a, a somewhat boring and technical name, is, is increasingly a topic of mainstream security conversation. There are some folks who are doing work on specific regions. This really took off with respect to Somali piracy, so you had a real emphasis on people talking about the Horn of Africa. But 
plenty of research on the Gulf of Guinea, uh, plenty of research on the Caribbean. A lot of this literature uh, is a niche component of regionalists, right? But that's, that's one way you can structure an approach to maritime security. And then there are a handful of folks doing work on specific issues in specific regions. Piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, piracy in the Horn of Africa, narcotics trafficking in the Caribbean. Uh, I want to start by saying all of that's incredibly important. It's hard for academia to survive unless people are, are digging as, as deep as humanly possible into individual subject matter. The problem that that can generate is that a lot of the research in academia tends to port into the way the policy world talks about a lot of these problem sets. And if you have a threat-specific conversation, if one person's talking about piracy, one person's talking about narcotics, one person's talking about human trafficking, you end up with what I'm, I call a sort of a counter-X approach, right? We're all familiar with conversations on counter-terrorism, counter-piracy, counter-narcotics. And it led me to wonder whether or not we could say something a little bit more coherent about the topic of maritime security. We agree that the maritime security is a thing that exists, right? We, it, it's a structured subtitle in U.S. Navy documents. What I have on the right here a cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power is kind of a high watermark uh, for maritime security in maritime service strategic literature. Uh, that's from 2007. But I'm wondering, okay, you open that strategy and it says we're going to deal with piracy, we're going to deal with terrorism, we're going to deal with narcotics trafficking. It doesn't really say a whole lot about why those things belong together other than the fact that they obviously don't belong under other things the Navy does. It's not major war fighting. It's not sea lanes of communication protection. But is there a coherence to the concept of maritime security? And if we can build a coherence, if we can build a theoretical framework for what it means for something to be a subject of maritime security, can that help us do maritime security better or more efficiently? Anybody have any questions about sort of that basic landscape? Okay. All right, so an, an obvious question and something that, that comes up anytime you're talking about maritime security is why should anybody care, right? I mean, and that, that only got in, increasingly difficult to explain over the last couple of years. So things that have taken place uh, over the lifespan of, of researching and writing and then publishing this book, Russian incursion into Crimea in 2014. All of a sudden, NATO has a clear reason for being again that it hasn't had in 20-some-odd years, right? We have a resurgence of this language of great power competition, I created a chart on the right there based off of an article I had read that shows the prevalence of the phrase great power competition in national media over the last three presidential administrations. Compare eight years of Bush 43, eight years of Obama to the first two and a half years of Trump. It's, it's absolutely exploded. Some of that is the defense blogosphere's love for certain phrases, and those things come and go. You can see the gray zone debate that took place a couple of years ago, and now we hardly ever see it anymore. So there's a little bit of that going on, but it really does signify a major transition in the how the national security community has coalesced around a specific strategic narrative in a way it really hadn't had in a very long time. You start to see that being reflected in national and maritime strategy creeping slowly. And just as a clarifier for folks who don't do a lot of Navy or maritime related work, through most of the Navy's history, it has published Navy specific documents, strategy documents. Cooperative Strategy for 21st Century Sea Power in 2007 is a tri service document. So it includes all three of the maritime services. That's the Coast Guard, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. And that's, it's unique as a service level document, the first major tri service maritime document the nation had published. So that's, a, that's a, a, an important deal. There's a revision to that document in 2015. It's called CS21R, R for the revision. And already in that document, you start to see the Navy walking back some of the emphasis on maritime security that it had imposed in the 2007 version. It's still in there, it's still its own subheading, but you can tell as a proportion of the overall document, it takes up a lot less space. This is no longer an immediately post 9-11 world. We're increasingly less interested in small scale or non-state threats. Again, prompted in large part uh, most acutely by the Russian incursion into Crimea in 2014, but of course the Chinese island building campaign that really gets particularly the Navy's attention that, oh hey, this is a shifting landscape and maybe we're not as well positioned and situated for this as we think. It also coalesces at the same time as uh, the uh, somewhat ill-fated uh, Asian pivot. 
but it underscores the same overall narrative in in the political discourse that right we're we're in a different era and is maritime security really the most important thing that we can be dealing with? That's crystallized in 2018 for anybody who hasn't read the unclassified summary of the national defense strategy. It's a, it's a perfect distillation of where we as a national security community are right now, that there are two threats that matter the most from a national security perspective. That's China first and foremost, followed by Russia. And then you cost effectively manage threats emanating from the other quote unquote three, uh, North Korea, Iran, and what used to be the plus one, which again in earlier literature is all sorts of non-state actors, transnational threats, terrorists, piracy, but in national defense strategy in the NDS in 2018 gets boiled down explicitly to terrorism. Right? So we're shrinking the space that at the broadest level the national security community is interested in non-state types of threats. And I think that's significant. So again, this is, this is where we are a book on maritime security coming out exactly at the moment where the whole paradigm is shifting towards great power competition. Okay, so why, sh why should you care? Well, I think the easiest answer is there's more than one thing happening in the world at any given time. Right? Quite understandably, the Pentagon, as the bureaucracy that it is, needs to coalesce around a fairly contiguous narrative in order to make sure everybody's marching in roughly the right direction. So I think one could have a debate whether or not GPC is, is the ideal framework for that, but it makes sense to have a framework, and it makes sense to have a framework that's focused on the major national security issues of the day. Now, that's a, that, if we want to sort of put on our, our national relations hats for a little bit since we're at a graduate program, that ref represents trends that are taking place within the global political system, right? But there are trends that are somewhat external to the way, let's say, a realist or a liberal school thinks about politics and thinks about the structure of international relations. So, for example, uh, I pull out some mega trends from uh, David Kilcullen's books, Out of the Mountains, which I think really speaks to some of these extra systemic challenges that are going to be with us over the next century. We've got to find a way to deal with, and they will have security implications. Rapid population growth, increasing urbanization, connectedness in all forms, both uh, real terms, literal, the way people are moving, but also communication systems. And all that coalesces in this idea of littoralization. For anybody who's not familiar, littoral is a geographic term and a really interesting one. Most other terms of geography that we're familiar with stay the same over time. A mountain is a mountain. It's really hard to change what a mountain is unless you blow it up. The definition doesn't really change over time. The littorals are different. The littorals are the spaces where Activities ashore can be events, can be influenced by assets or activities at sea, and activities at sea can be influenced by platforms and activities ashore. So it's this really nebulous space along the coast, but it is not the coast. The coast is a geographic feature in its own right. The littoral is a social space where you can leverage influence from the sea ashore and from the shore a sea. So why is that interesting? Why is that novel? It changes with time as technology changes. As technology grows, the space that can be influenced from either side of that arena on the coastal edge magnifies. A lot of folks are familiar with the concept of a territorial sea. Right? The earliest idea of the territorial sea is about three nautical miles. Where does that come from? It's roughly as far as you can shoot a cannon with a favorable wind. Right? So the literals have always been, and that's an important way, way that we have defined the international system is this idea that there is such a thing as territorial sea. It's now 12 nautical miles. It's been largely disconnected from technology because you can fly an airplane quite a lot farther than that. But there's always been this really fascinating dynamic between technology, a cannon being a technology in and of itself, and how we think about the littoral space. Okay, so there are these four megatrends that are taking place that are outside of the normal political process. There are more people on the planet, they're coalescing, in greater densities, they're increasingly connected to one another, and they're doing all of that, by and large, in coastal spaces. So for example, uh, the vast majority of the world's population lives within uh, 30 miles of the coastline. So for a healthy person, that's about a day's walk, right? That's a huge proportion of the global population lives in, as is increasingly coalescing in, littoral spaces that are often fairly urbanized. Okay, that's half of this argument. The other half, I still quite haven't answered the question of, okay, but really, why should you sitting in this room care? That's maybe an issue for Nigeria uh, or Lebanon 
or large parts of Indonesia. But why should anybody in the U.S. national security infrastructure really give this a second thought? And the answer comes to what happens when you have that dynamic taking place broadly across the global south. So one idea that I found really helpful was the concept of feral spaces. This is something that I took out of a Naval War College Review article by Richard Norton. Uh, Norton proposes the idea that these spaces grow to such an extent that it is theoretically possible that a city simply loses its ability to exercise any form of security or governance in that arena. The example he proposes is Mogadishu. Absolutely implodes, right? What's fascinating about the feral spaces concept is operates on two tiers. On the one hand, you can have a feral city within a functioning country. It's perfectly possible to have areas, perhaps even entire cities, where there are governance failures, but the country continues to exist. The country continues, for example, to vote on resolutions at the United Nations. Not the case with Somalia. Mogadishu implodes, but the whole country becomes a failed state. But it is theoretically possible that you can have entire cities that are failed cities within technically functioning or at least internationally recognized states. That's an interesting phenomenon. We're not quite there yet. Where we are is if you take feral cities down, so instead of going up to the national level, you go down to the suburban level. You can have, and we do have, feral pockets within largely functioning cities. So these are places within huge, sprawling, for example, slums, favelas in, in Sao Paulo or Rio, uh, various parts of Lagos, potentially, in Nigeria, uh, parts of San Pedro Sula in Honduras, where the city functions. There is city administration, but there are large pockets of urban coastal spaces where the primary authority is no longer the government. Those pockets are feral. Okay, I'm inching towards the why should you care, but I don't think we've, we've totally hit that that threshold yet. And the answer comes with that connectedness component, right? What happens in those spaces has an impact globally. And it's not that those spaces are ungoverned. I think that there's a bit of a misnomer we throw around with ungoverned spaces. Somebody's in charge. Power fills a vacuum. Who's in charge of those spaces is, is going to have an impact on how those spaces are governed. So for example, it's usually an organization that can exercise some sort of normative control so they impose rules and regulations. This is, I think, an underserved part of, for example, the appeal in some parts of Lebanon of Hezbollah. Right? They deliver services. They impose predictable rules on people. You know that if you follow X, Y, and Z, you will in all likelihood evade strong criticism or punishment on the part of whatever the ruling junta is. But if they can't exercise violent control as well, then they'll be overthrown. So there's an, a, an actual capacity for these organizations who are stepping into feral spaces to exercise real violence. If you want an example from today, the, there's reports in the newspaper that the Houthi rebels uh, hijacked a Saudi tug, right? This is a non-state group that has sufficient technical mastery of the instruments of violence that they are now producing problems in an international maritime space. So it's this consequence of a feral city and the organizations that are, have violent capacity that fill that space have the potential to have really negative implications in the maritime arena, which is fundamentally international, right? So that's where it comes to the, why should we care? Houthi rebels taking pot shots with anti-ship cruise missiles at U.S. Navy destroyers, which has fundamental changes in the way that the Navy de deploys deplo uh, destroyers uh, in the Gulf of Aden for several months doing convoy runs, right? These are significant implications for U.S. Navy operational deployments that are produced by a non-state actor that's leveraged control of a feral space. So that's, that's an example. But I think the, the real sort of uppercut to the argument and why anybody should care comes from a former professor of mine who I think is, is pretty wise in this statement, which is that state responses to non-state violence have a tendency to change history a lot more than the acts of non-state violence themselves. Right? So failure to think through effectively and early how the United States Navy and Maritime Services and allied and partner Navy and Maritime Services plan on tackling the sorts of issues that percolate from non-state threats in muddy waters and in littoral spaces means that we really run the risk of overreacting or ineffectively reacting when something inevitably happens. Right? I think getting that, thinking through these problem sets, 
before there's a crisis, before this comes to a head, in order to make sure that if, for example, you think great power competition is the most appropriate framing for the era that we're in, that we don't all of a sudden yank every available resource from the Indo-Pacific to address a small-scale problem in the Eastern Mediterranean that had, with enough forethought, we addressed over a sustained period of time earlier, maybe we would have been able to mitigate. Okay, so the underlying effort there is that even in a policy space where we're really talking about great power competition, it makes sense to take a little bit of time to think about maritime security. That's sort of part one, so I'll pause if anybody has any questions to interject, otherwise I'll... I'll barrel through. Please. Um, with this kind of restructuring, how we think, is there is there an increase in how what, what we're seeing regarding criminality and terrorism kind of merging in one space, or yeah? So that's uh, that's a great lead-in to. Uh, something that I'll talk about in a couple of slides, but the, 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 the answer is, right, so I talked about we, the, act, the scholarship, but also the policy community has a tendency to address a lot of maritime security and non-state issues as counter something, very specific. We have counterterrorism, we have counter piracy, we have counter narcotics. The reality is most of the actors in those spaces, and in, in particular in the maritime arena, are not just terrorists, they're not just insurgents, right? They're, they're not just narcotics traffickers. There is a real ad hocracy in that space. And so something I'll talk about in a little bit as I build towards the argument is there's a real benefit in thinking much more holistically about maritime security issues. And you know, there's a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a greater dialogue on sort of this crime terror nexus. And I think that was moving us in the right direction, but it's still a little bit, that was mostly a means of terrorism scholarship to sort of expand its footprint a little bit. And I think it's more useful to think that there's just a much looser network of how these individuals and how these pathways communicate with one another. And that getting our hands around that, for example, by thinking about maritime security in a more strategic context, would produce a much more effective and efficient counter whatever strategy you were looking for. But thank you. Okay, so the, the I'll start a little bit with the, the, the premise behind the book. Um, the maritime arena is a complicated space to operate. It's incredibly expensive. Um, anybody who owns a boat knows that it's, it's uh, not particularly uh, a cost-effective hobby, as fun as it may be. Uh, so who are the actors that are traditionally operating in this space? From a national perspective, it's mostly navies. It's a few coast guards and constabulary forces, but by and large, we're talking about navies. Okay. The problem is all the challenges I just laid out are not obviously challenges that a Navy deals with. These are small-scale issues, and really if you enumerate them, they're mostly criminal issues. Right? I think we can have a, a debate separately about whether you want to address something like terrorism as a criminal issue versus uh, a military issue over the last 15, 20 years. We've cited heavily on the military issue. It did not always used to be that way, and I think there are arguments on either side. But by and large, if you are talking about narcotics trafficking, if you're talking about human trafficking, if you're talking about illegal fishing, these are issues that look a lot more like crime than they do like war. So the challenging question becomes, what do you do when your primary actor in this arena is a military actor, predominantly the Navy, but the primary challenge, at least at a maritime security level, is predominantly criminal in focus. And that's really sort of the, the, the underlying argument in the book is, how do you square that circle? And more specifically, Instead of backing into this the way a lot of naval analysts would, which is, what can I learn from Mahan or Corbett, sort of the godfathers of, of, of Navy strategy, in a lower-tiered threat context, the approach I took was, well, what if we look to criminology? There's a, whole, there's a whole world of literature that looks at crime issues. It just so happens to be that most crime takes place on land, so most of that literature focuses on land. But could we learn something by applying a crime-oriented lens towards maritime issues. So that's sort of the, the major thrust of the book. And I will say, uh, I'm a, I was cribbing real hard from the criminology literature. Um, and there's a risk in its own right of doing um, cross-disciplinary, cross multidisciplinary work. But I hope that I can convince folks who are either uh, doing graduate work or doing research in their own right that it was worth stepping over the line because I think it yields some really interesting findings. So the theory that I, that I pulled from uh, is broken windows theory. Um, 
for anybody who's interested, broken windows theory, uh, it's actually, it originates in a 1982 article in the Atlantic magazine. So you don't need LexisNexis. You don't, you know, this is not behind a paywall. This is the only academic article in the history of academic articles that you should just Google and find. Um, published in 1982, and it's because it is published in a regular old magazine, it's very readable. Uh, and it lays out the main tenets, which eventually get built up over time more formally into the theory. The idea behind the argument is that, and it, I should mention, it's a progenitor of community policing. So community policing has, has evolved considerably over time, but it's an, it's an idea, a progenitor of the, of, the criminal, of the policing idea that Police and enforcement should be centered in communities and working to advance the interests and meet the needs of that community. And now, nowadays, that seems fairly obvious, uh, but the mid-century model of policing in the United States is police officers sitting in their cars waiting to be dispatched to intercept crime in the moment, right? And so there is a transition towards being proactive, being out front, the idea that you could mitigate crime before it happens. So this is a real transition in thinking in, in, in the mid-'80s uh, in, criminolo in criminology and literature responding to um, a real spike in, in crime, including violent crime, in the 1980s and 1990s. Okay, what are the main tenets of a broken windows style policing? Well, the idea is that you are responding and deeply responsive to subtle stimuli environment, in your environment. So it, this is not purely a rational actor theory of crime. Rational actor being you have decided, you have weighed the, the risks and benefits that robbing that bodega is probably going to work for you. It's going to better your stance, so now you are robbing that bodega. That's not what, what Broken Windows is about. The best analogy I can give is imagine you came into this room with, with coffee cups and you finished drinking your coffee and the central table was littered with empty Starbucks and Dixie cups. You would be far more likely to leave your cup on the table when you left. Not because you made the strategic calculus that nobody was going to yell at you, but because you were responding to signals that you were picking up in the environment, often without really thinking it through, that this is a space where there is not communal self-efficacy. Right? This is a space where there is not a community sense that we care about what happens here and we are going to enforce certain standards and rules in this arena. On the other hand, this is a very clean environment. And so the odds are when you get up to leave, you're going to bring your coffee cup with you and find a trash can. Right? That's fundamental to the idea of the broken windows theory, that you are responding to signals in your environment. And so from an enforcement perspective, shifting the environment can have derivative benefits for the activities of individuals in that domain. Now, that is both the physical environment. So the, 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 ter the theory gets its name from the example of literal broken windows, right? The example of if you are walking down a street in a city and you see a warehouse with a broken window on it, if you come back two or three days later, there's a good chance where all the windows in that building will be broken. Why is that the case in some parts of a city and not in other parts of the city? The answer is not because there is a disproportionate distribution of window lovers and window breakers in cities. It's not how we divide ourselves. It's because in certain parts of that city, the landlord, the community interest group, whomever, will fix that window, right? Like that's, that's the signal in your environment that somebody is paying attention to this space and cares about what happens here. In other parts of the city, it might not get fixed. So what happens? People realize nobody's paying attention to what happens in this space, and it's actually kind of fun to throw a rock at a window, so all of a sudden all the windows are broken, right? That's the, that's the physical answer. But the reality is people are responding, people internalize their environment in pretty complicated ways. And so we can think about context, not just as the physical space, graffiti, for example, but the way that we internalize people's behavior in an environment and how you would respond to the question, people really care about what happens in my neighborhood, in my school, in my workplace. Right? So there's sort of a softer and subtler psychologic component to this, but that's fundamental from a theory perspective to the idea behind broken windows theory. So when it's implemented in New York City, in the most famous example, in the mid to late 1990s, in the subway first and foremost, before it's expanded to the city at large, what happens is they tackle graffiti and they tackle fair beating. And all of a sudden, you start to see a drastic reduction in not just fair beating and graffiti on the New York City subway, but all sorts of constituent crimes. So that's, that's the side on the left here, and I think sort of and something I'll return to a little bit is if we're extrapolating, because you didn't come here for a talk on criminology, you came here for a talk on maritime security, and I will get back to that, but if we're extrapolating from a maritime perspective or from a strategy conversation, what can we think about this topic? Well, that leads us to wonder about the social spaces in our strategies, right? That, that 
activity takes place where people are. One of my least favorite terms is transnational organized crime because it gives the idea that the crime is somehow taking place in the ether of transnationalism. But there is no transnationalvania, right? It takes place in individual places, often in individual communities. These are taking place, these crimes are a string of crimes that take place at individual moments with individual people. And so thinking about the social spaces of our strategies is important and relevant, and I can answer questions about that, about what that might look like in a, in a non-maritime context. But uh, think about, uh, so the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, is somewhat famous from a maneuver standpoint of blasting holes in walls, right? which is incredibly important to keep soldiers safe when operating in tight urban spaces, for example, in Gaza. But it also, you are making a statement about how you are interacting with that environment and non-combatants in that environment. So it's certainly not a winning hearts and minds strategy, right? That's not a normative judgment on whether or not you should or shouldn't do it. I'm not the one responsible for, for going through walls in a hostile environment. But in, there is a sense that, that we have deferred against considerations of the social and in social context of the environment in favor of an immediate and obvious tactical benefit. So that's sort of what I mean by that front. I mentioned that that's the theory part, right? So if you read the 1982 article uh, in The Atlantic, that's the story that you'll get. There's a what happens in practice scenario that's also really interesting. And what you end up seeing is, so I'll go back to the New York City subway uh, example, that when you're arresting individuals for, let's say, fare beating, uh, in the subway, about one in eight, one in ten individuals just happened to be wanted on a felony or a class A misdemeanor or were carrying a weapon. And so that led to a fairly dramatic derivative benefit of enforcing uh, what used to be called quality of life crimes. And the implication that if you are focusing on these signal crimes, if you're focusing on the lowest end types of issues, you can have derivative benefits all the way up the crime food chain up to and including uh, murder, uh, up to including uh, violent, uh, violent thieving. Uh, so th that's a really fascinating element. And so the way I'm, I talk about these two in the book is that we should talk about crime and therefore maritime security as being context dependent. What can we do to shape the context of the environment, both physically, but also psychologically, that people are living and working within in order to reduce this subtle incentive to engage in criminal activity. But also, how do we, how do we take greater hold, and this speaks to, to your question earlier, about the idea that, that crime is, is in fact multidimensional, and that if you are focusing on one type of criminal activity, you may be actually having derivative benefits on other types of crime. And so I've, I've listed some examples here in the maritime space to sort of get us back on track. Um, there's a, a strong hypothesized relationship between uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing and piracy. Uh, so there's a lot of literature on the role of toxic dumping in Somalia and the rise of first wave Somali piracy uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, there's a lot of great work, including by the International Labor Organization, on the interplay between human trafficking and illegal fishing. That's particularly acute in Southeast Asia. Uh, gun running and drug smuggling in the Caribbean, those work on the same networks. The same individuals who are pushing drugs north are moving bulk cash and guns south, right? So there's a, there's a direct interplay between those networks and, those, uh, and the individuals and, and the networks that are involved in transporting that. Uh, and then, for example, oil theft and insurgency in West Africa, in the Gulf of Guinea. I, I have a sort of a stylized example, uh, a quote from a former governor of Nigeria's river state that I think really summarizes this. And it's important to note, so in the book, I really go at pains uh, to pull from scholarship from the individual case study. So I've got the Caribbean, I've got the Gulf of Guinea, and I've got uh, Straits of Malacca and Singapore. And there's a lot of local academia and local practitioners that are writing and talking about this. And I think it's easy to ignore that because it's not part of a dominant conversation, sort of traditional Western policy for sure, but even academia. But the folks who live in these regions know the sorts of issues they're dealing with. And they've been upfront about this for a long time. So the governor notes, Someone might one day kidnap an oil worker in order to buy a flashy car. The next day he may join a raid by a militant group and on the third day hijack a rig to generate cash for his chief or to get jobs for his community. Right? This is one person who, from a distant Washington policy perspective, we would be inclined to label an insurgent, maybe, or a transnational organized criminal, or just a local belligerent and thug. But the reality is this person is both all of those things and none of those things. And so how do you account for that in a strategy? What happens 
if the U.S. Coast Guard has a cutter in the Gulf of Guinea and is doing piracy enforcement and happens to catch a guy who's smuggling illegal fish that day. Right? He might have been a pirate the next day, but that day he's, he's an illegal sm uh, fish smuggler. Right? Do, how do we account for that in our strategies? And how do we account for the fact that the reality of this environment is a lot more multidimensional than we give it credit for? I'll take another pause before I go on. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Kind of based on this, are you advocating that we should move maybe away from military deployments, which are kind of broadsword and more towards uh, Coast Guard and police deployments? Sure. Be more well, so, so two things. Uh, the benefit of being an academic and an analyst is I don't have to advocate for anything. <laughs> um, but no, more to your point. So I think it goes back to this is a difficult space to operate in. And the reality is the U.S. Coast Guard, which is far and away the most capable Coast Guard in the world, is overstretched to begin with. Right? And I think anybody, anybody at higher levels in Navy policy will tell you that they would love a plus up in the Coast Guard if for nothing else for, for them to help with exactly this stuff. But so far it's not coming. And even more so for constabulary forces. There are no major police organizations that can take this on. And so that's part of the challenge that I'm wrestling with this with in, the, in the book is this is inevitably a weird dichotomy between the issue is fundamentally a criminal issue and dealing with it in a criminal way is going to be most effective. But the organization, at least from an American context, that is going to be responsible for implementing this is inevitably riding on gray holes. Please. And a perfect example is... Uh bad old days in uh, Colombia and Peru in the mid-90s when uh, we were permitted to help them with counter-narcotics, but we weren't permitted to help them in their counter-guerrilla fight. Right. Unfortunately, right. those are very frequently the same people. Right. Uh, we made it happen, but um, if someone had wanted to, to say, well, are you doing counter-narcotics or are you doing counter-FARC? Uh, we would have had a hard time explaining that there's really a difference. Well, right. There is no difference. Right. Yeah. In, in practice, these are hugely interrelated issues. It's, in, it's often the same people, the same, the same networks, the same ad hoc groups. But the way U.S. policy works is you are authorized to be there, and for good reason, right? I mean, we don't want mission creep. We want to make sure that when we're sending people into harm's way, U.S. service members doing a job that in theory should enhance a partner nation's security to further the U.S. security. We should be doing it in very discreet ways in theory, but it has real implications when the rubber meets the road that the world doesn't quite work that way. And so what can we do to tailor authorities where maybe you're there specifically for a counter-narcotics mission, but should you be fighting with one hand tied behind your back because the world doesn't, doesn't work the way you are legislating in policy? And I think that's a great example. Thank you. So something I'll, I'll wrap up with on, on this second of three sections. So I'm getting there. Uh, that I think is really helpful about taking a criminology approach and specifically looking at broken windows and looking at community policing is that it helps us understand when we get this enforcement wrong, right? So uh, there's a concept called herbicide, which I think is, is really helpful. You can over-police an environment. And I think that a lot of the, uh, the debate that we're having domestically really speaks to the negative implications of, among other things, a broken windows-inspired policing that potentially goes too far, right? To overly police these, these minuscule quality of life crimes, or perhaps to over-penalize them, even if you feel like that they should still be enforced, has the potential for communities to feel that they are being policed against and not policed with and through, right? But I think this gives us the language to talk about that. Understanding the dialogue that's taking place in a community policing context helps us understand that cracking down aggressively and against the very communities that you will need to invest in their own self-efficacy is, is fairly detrimental to the long-term interest. Um, a great example that I like to pull from uh, is this idea that David Kilcullen issues on uh, a neighborhood in, in Jamaica. There, so there are garrison districts in, in, in different parts of Kingston, Jamaica, where essentially they're ruled by local gangs. And those gangs are allowed to rule that space and to extract rent from those environments if they deliver votes to whichever political constituency is affiliated with that particular garrison district. Uh, in the mid-2000s, the U.S. decided that it was going to levy a warrant on one of those individuals who ran a gang in that neighborhood. It was the Koch Posse, uh, Koch being the name of the guy who organized it. And he was so deeply entrenched in his community, he's this Tivoli Gardens, so you can 
you can Wikipedia if you're interested, or buy the book. Um, that the the Jamaican police had to call in the Jamaican military and essentially engaged in a multi-day siege with this community, including artillery and mortar fire, to try and arrest this guy who, by the way, escapes, right? So one argues, okay, should he be arrested? Probably, and he eventually is. Is that the most effective way to do it? What are you, what are you as an institution, what are you as a nation, what are you as a military communicating to a given neighborhood who ultimately you will need on your side if you are going to get the relevant intelligence you need to ferret out long-term threats to that community. So that's a fantastic example of what herbicide looks like uh, in, a, in an urban context, but I think we can think about that from the same perspective from a maritime security context. Right? You can over-criminalize in the same way that you can over-police a space, and that's something we should be particularly cognizant of if we're using military resources to prosecute what are effectively criminal issues, right? There's a real risk that an organization that is trained to put holes in the water may overcorrect towards that, which is not in the long-term interest of a strategy that is predicated on something like community policing, building up local communities to protect themselves against various types of transnational organized threats. And again, it speaks to accounting for the social spaces. That's that same issue. Right? That this is a this is a more organic concept of what this what society is, and you need society on your side in order to effectively root out these criminal enterprises that can sort of see through and take root in them. This is not the same thing as a, 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 as an invasion force. Right? You, you need to work by with and through the community. This offers us a way to do that. Please. Um, going with your recent analogy in Jamaica, they had to bring in the military to take down this like, local thug. I'm just thinking right now of what recently occurred in Mexico in Culiacan when the military tried to take down Chapo Guzman's son. They didn't succeed. Right. I, I think people. I don't know if that's a very uh, appropriate analogy. I mean, but, um, that thug was had thoroughly outmaneuvered, outstrategized, and outgunned the military. Right. They were getting ready to massacre their families, the, the families of the military, and that's what brought them to their knees. Because yeah. they had, obviously, Chapo Guzman's henchmen had well thought out and planned what to do, because they had that city well uh, bracketed and under siege within 10 minutes or so. They, don't, they had a plan. Right. Yeah. The Mexican military did not. These are sophisticated actors. I spent a lot of time in one of the chapters talking about the concept of hybrid threats, which speaks yeah. to, again, right, this is not purely, so it looks a lot more like crime than war, but a lot of these are incredibly sophisticated and well-resourced non-state actors, which just makes this a messier conversation, but yeah. speaks again towards the fact that you're going to need the military to engage with this. Simultaneously, these are deeply entrenched organizations that often have significant support in their communities, right? So it's that balance of you, we need to find a way to engage the social space and our strategies, while at the same time finding a way to leverage military resources to operate in often non-military contexts. Uh, it, it's a really messy issue, but one that we see time and again that this, this is not clear cut. You need strategies that are capable of dealing with the ambiguity that comes with a pseudo-criminal hybrid threat context it just doesn't look like the sort of thing that your standard Navy literature in particular is going to train you to operate on. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm turning the corner. This is the sort of the final section. I'll talk a little bit about um, some implications uh, from this research. From an academy perspective, I think it's obvious we need more research on the concept of maritime security, right? I mean, the, uh, there, people can, should, still do individual research on individual topics about piracy, narcotics, follow your heart, more research is good research. But we're, we're pretty deficient from an academic standpoint on literature that talks about what maritime security means or is as a strategic issue, how we integrate it with larger national strategies, things, things to that end. How does maritime security fit into the context of great power competition? There's a lot more work that needs to be done in a US domestic context that front. Um, you know, one of my one of my pet projects right now is trying to understand what does maritime security mean in great power competition. We talk about a spectrum of competition. So are we competing with Russia and China, for example, also at the low end of the threat spectrum? And if so, how does that advantage great power competition? And what would that look like? Where would one do that? 
I think there's, there's a lot of research that needs to go into threading maritime security as an, as an issue of strategy into the larger dialogue on strategy. Uh, and then I'll just throw in from an academic perspective. So I borrowed from, from criminology, and I borrowed one specific theory from criminology. I happen to think it was compelling and interesting. Are there other theories in criminology that could teach us something different about what enforcement in a maritime space would look like? Are there other theories from other disciplines? What, does sociology have something to tell us that might differ from criminology? And can we have an equally interesting and compelling conversation on maritime security as a strategic issue by borrowing from other forms of academia? From a practice perspective, this is a lot of stuff we've covered already, but how do you balance the military means, right? The gray holes that the United States is inevitably going to be using in most of these situations against a policing way, right? A, a technique of enforcement that is infused with the idea that you are policing with a community, not against it. And again, in pursuit of social ends, you are trying to, you are trying to change the context of these local communities. And sometimes that is something the US can do directly. Oftentimes it is something we're gonna need to be doing in partnership with others. How do we bake that in to a Navy strategy while not diluting the Navy's primary focus and interest, which is of course if, is deterring and if need be winning a major power of war. The second balance I think is, is something I'll, um, I'll leave us on is the value of following the local lead. So I mentioned a couple of slides ago here that there are relationships between different types of maritime criminality. The United States has obvious interests and equities in reducing some over others. Terrorism is a great example. Piracy was sort of the derivative of that in some arenas, certainly in places where uh, Lloyd's insurance was going through the roof, for example, the Horn of Africa, the United States has a strong interest uh, in, in suppressing piracy there. What I think is important for us as a policy community to think about is our interests don't always line up with, with partner interests. And I think Southeast Asia is a really interesting example of this. We're deeply interested in countering terrorism in that region. And as a derivative of that, we're interested in countering piracy, um, both because there are relationships between those networks, but also the prospect that piracy could be used as a way to fund terrorist activity. It turns out not all of our prospective partners in the region are as deeply seized by the issue of piracy as we are. Indonesia is far more interested in suppressing illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing because that is eating deeply into state coffers and it's an issue of human security because it's an issue of food security for a predominantly archipelagic nation. Understandable. Malaysia is an alternative example. Malaysia is deeply concerned with human trafficking. Equally not as seized by the issue of piracy. Now, the United States obviously is a sophisticated and large actor, and we're resourcing a lot of these initiatives, so we can get them to come to the table to talk about piracy. But something that I'm proposing is, well, if, if crime is actually truly multidimensional in this space, if these networks overlap, and policing against one and enforcing against one has likely downstream impacts on other issues, that you can create greater long-term buy-in from local partners and allies by following their lead. Go all in on illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing in Indonesian waters. Go all in on countering human trafficking in Malaysian waters. Right? You are building access, which, hey, by the way, might have derivative benefits from a great power competition perspective. But at the same time, you might also reduce the types of things that you were initially concerned about. You'll see reductions in piracy in both places, because we know from the research that these things are deeply overlapping. The last bit I'll leave there is, is sort of the, the, the major point is that partnerships matter from, the, from, from that analogy, from that, from that example. People matter, right? This is all predicated in an idea that, that these crimes and activities take place in communities. We're going to shape the context of those communities in order to have an outsized impact. And perspective matters, talking about the idea of context, that people are interacting with their environment and their space, and so shaping that space is in and of itself a strategic imperative. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to open it up for questions. Please. Uh, moving uh, closer to home, uh, you know, when you think about American uh, security, you know, our, our continental security, for example, we've got the Border Patrol, you know, to take care of the basically the, the north and south borders. We've got the Air Force and the Navy patrol the coasts. Um, so you asked about, you know, Terrorism a crime or 
something as basic as, as uh, board security, we have like a, I'm not saying misguided, but we have a confusing array of, of you know, like who's in charge of, of who, who's supposed to be watching the border. So uh, and it comes up, it relates to your topic because not just the Atlantic and the uh, Pacific are on the water waterways, right? So um, it just seems to me that it's, it's not, not really a holistic way of looking at our security, you know, and, uh, what, what, uh, why do we have the, the, the uh, basically the military, the two of our borders, and the, 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 you know, yeah, I mean, there's, the other two, it doesn't make sense. To well, and, and, you know, so I'm certainly not the one to talk about sort of the overall breakdown of, of how the U.S. divides enforcement and, and, and uh, military on the one hand, or law enforcement on the other, but I think it's, it's the overall point is really valuable that this is a complicated space, particularly for the United States, because we have so many different actors who specialize in very niche types of enforcement. Many of the partners we work with do not have the same breakdown, right? Many of them do not have the imposition of posse comitatus, where their Navy forces are not also the ones that are performing the local maritime security and policing initiatives. And that makes it really complicated, because the entity, from a maritime perspective, that has a lot of the requisite knowledge and skills to work on maritime security issues is truly the U.S. Coast Guard. It just does not have the adequate scale to operate everywhere the United States sees maritime security interests. And so I think that's something we hear quite a lot of from, from partner nations. Something that I tried to avoid, so any, any conversation on the Navy, uh, if it doesn't immediately go down to like what ships should we buy, I think is a success. Uh, but I will dive into the what ships should we buy scenario for a little bit, which is to say, that vessels that specialize in these lower emission sets that are easier for smaller or even medium tier nations to operate with is something to consider, right? Because this is this is a specialty in and of itself. And anytime you're devoting a multi-mission, multi-billion dollar platform like a DDG to uh, IUU fishing in the Gulf of Guinea is, is time that we see in opportunity costs to it being in the high north, deterring Russia, or in the Indo-Pacific, uh, doing fawn ops against China. And the reality is, we just simply don't send them there. It's incredibly rare that we send gray holes to these spaces. So what ends up is we mostly just end up ignoring them. Um, and you know, we have we have lots of efforts on land to conduct training to build maritime domain awareness. But this is an operational domain. You need to be there in order to count. And so there's a real sort of uh, implication to, to your to your point, which is. We've divided stuff in a way that's not necessarily indicative of how most of the partners that we work with divide these responsibilities. Often it just means that we leave a gaping hole. Can I answer any other questions? Please. Uh, along the same line, you mentioned uh, the word holistic. The Chinese don't seem to have any problem uh, uh, with uh, a conflict between their various strategies. I was just riding over here with uh, an Ethiopian uh, cab driver who was lamenting the influence of China uh, in all arenas in his part of the world where he came from originally, Africa, specifically the Horn of Africa. Um, they uh, comment, please, on, uh, on their view of this. Well, and so, so I'll start from the U.S. perspective. I, I think I mean, the, the great white whale of the American government is the whole of government solution, right? And we all know we need it, especially to something from a maritime security context where this is partially an enforcement issue. But a lot of this is, right, and the literature is obvious on this, that right, what causes piracy? It's instability on land, right? You can mitigate that issue at sea, but fundamentally, I mentioned littorals at the start of this talk. These are littoral issues. The, 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 the maritime space the seaward portion of that is one part of that solution, but that needs to be involved with delivering resources and effects on shore as well. And I think that a more nuanced strategic approach to maritime security is a small step in that direction, but the reality is, yeah, I mean, we are not as sophisticated in our ability to leverage these whole of government solutions. We have a really difficult time conceptualizing and operating in gray zone spaces these spaces short of armed conflict. I think we've convinced ourselves we'll never be good at it, which is in fact not the case, and there's a, you know, plenty of research in history that shows the United States is engaged in all sorts of gray zone operations over history. We, we can do this should we want to. I think we should also not lose sight of the fact that this is also aid and development. This is also diplomacy, right? This is complicated, and again, it goes back to viewing these as social spaces. So I don't have an easy answer to the question, but I, I think we see, particularly in China, 
that in many cases they seem at least to be better at this than we are. We need to have a more nuanced view of what is the maritime space, how does maritime security intersect with great power competition, are we advantaged by conducting maritime security near the shores of Ethiopia, even just to be there, right? Because it signals to the Ethiopians that, that we're there, we're paying attention, and oh, hey, by the way, maybe you want to double check whether or not that major infrastructure agreement with the Chinese is in your long-term interests or whether the United States can be there for them. I think that's a, it's a perspective avenue. So then isn't, kind of taking what you just said, isn't the ultimate maritime security economic prosperity in on land? A lot of ways, yeah. I mean, in the same way, I mean, yes, in the same way that one could say that well, the best way to solve crime is, is just to fix the economy, right? So, like, it is true, and we can do a lot more, and we should do a lot more, but invariably, in the pathway to getting to there and recognizing we'll never quite get utopia, we'll also need an enforcement angle. And I think that's where these, these things overlap. But yeah, I mean, we, again, I, I drive the conversation, which is not something I think we hear quite enough of in, in a national security context, but these are, these are social spaces. People live there. We're comfortable with talking about that from a counterinsurgency and counterterror perspective, right? You know, countering, you know, Mao's, you know, fish in the sea and drying out the lake. We're, we're familiar with the winning hearts and mind model in that arena. We're not always super good at it, which is why I think we need to talk a little bit more intelligently about the types of strategies we can borrow for that. Um, but I think we'll inevitably need um, to have that conversation from a maritime perspective. But aid is a big part of that, and development is a big part of that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. This is a lot of fun, and I appreciate your questions and thoughts.